Good morning, everyone. We will get started in just a couple of minutes. If you are here and looking to get credits for Act 38 Nutrient Management Planning, we're going to ask that you please use the chat, put your name and your certification number in there, and we will ask again for that at the end of the webinar as well. So in order to get those credits, you need to have your name in at the beginning and at the end per the SCC guidance that we've received. If you're looking to get CCA credits, you'll see this screen that is scrolling um, now there is a QR code that you can scan there and get your credits. I believe it's the next screen, but if you wanna just put your information in the chat there too, that's fine as well, whichever is your preference. Just remember to put your name and your certification number in the chat so that we can ensure we're getting credits to the right people. Getting feedback that the chat is currently disabled, so we're going to look into what is happening there, and we will get that open for you in just a minute. Sue, are you able to get that chat opened up? Hey, Brooke, I'm working on it. Okay, perfect. Yep. And I just stopped sharing my screen, Jess, so in case you want to move on. Okay, sounds good. Well, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists. We will get that chat up and running, and I'll put a message in there once we, or Sue can send a message out to the group once that's in there. Um, we are really excited for the first of our three field trial webinars today, and we are happy to welcome Dr. Charlie White and Dr. Paul Isker uh, to present to us about their work in field trials with Penn State University. So Charlie is the Soil Fertility and Nutrient Management Extension Specialist at Penn State, uh, working with a variety of farmers to conduct on-farm research. So he specializes in nitrogen recommendations for corn, cover crops, and soil health, as well as precision fertility management. Um, Charlie is really interested in how uh, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus can be managed to promote sustainable ag systems. And he's gonna share some of his research, most of it focusing on corn with us today, uh, one, one trial on soybeans, but he's gonna leave most of that to Paul uh, as that is his area of specialty. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Paul as well at this time, uh, but Charlie's gonna kick us off. But Dr. Paul Isker is uh, an epidemi epidemiologist and field crop extension pathologist with Penn State as well as Penn State Extension. He's leading the Pennsylvania Soybean on Farm Network, uh, which is a collaboration between the Pennsylvania Soybean Board and Penn State, focusing on using on-farm research models, field monitoring and scouting, as well as providing educational extension programming. So we're really excited to have both Charlie and Paul here with us. And without um, their support of the, the 4R Alliance, um, 
you know, we wouldn't be able to put on, on these really informative programs for you. So I just want to outline a couple of guidelines for you. You're welcome to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen for any questions that you have. Uh, we will hold questions until the end of the session in order to ensure that both Charlie and Paul are able to present their full content. And then at the end of our webinar today, there is a survey that we would love for you to answer so we can continuously improve our content and the information that we provide to you as an organization. So if you wouldn't mind, it's uh, five questions. It'll take you three minutes. It just opens in a separate tab of your browser. We would really appreciate the feedback once this is done. So without further ado, I will turn this over to Charlie. Thanks a lot. Great, thank you, Brooke. Um, it's great to be here today. Really appreciate the uh, Pennsylvania 4R Alliance and work that Brooke and Sue do to put these webinars on. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So I'm gonna uh, share my screen here and get my PowerPoint slides loaded up. So um, what I wanted to do today was uh, discuss some um, ideas and best practices for conducting on-farm research. I'm gonna share some examples of work that my group has done in partnership with farmers and extension educators and industry. Um, but also, I want to inspire you all to maybe take uh, start doing on-farm research or take the on-farm research that you do, take that to the next level. Um, and so hopefully, you know, the, some of the examples I share will be um, inspiring for you. So, um, you know, my suggestions for how to get started with on-farm research or improve your own on-farm research is to start with asking yourself a few questions uh, before you even set foot in the field or even start to scope out your project. But you know, think about what is the question you're trying to answer, right? At the end of the day, what would you like to come away with You know, an answer on? It might be a practice, it might be a product, it might be um, you know, anything. And then ask yourself, who's the audience, right? Um, you might be a farmer and you're trying to answer that question for yourself, or maybe you're an advisor and you're trying to answer that for a specific farmer that you're consulting for. Uh, maybe you're also trying to create an answer for a community of farmers. A lot of my work in extension, we're developing nutrient recommendations for, uh, you know, all agronomic crop producers in Pennsylvania and the broader region. And so we're not just trying to get an answer for one farmer, but for a group of farmers. Maybe you're trying to provide, generate tools that industry can use to improve their services. Maybe you're trying to inform policy um, and you want the answers to be adopted by policymakers or to influence policy. Um, think about the resources you have, right? What field space do you have with your farmer collaborators, right? Do you have a little plot of land? Do you have a big plot of land? What equipment is available um, that the farmer might have or that uh, a retailer might be able to bring in and provide or that the farmer might be able to borrow from a neighbor? Um, you know, so field equipment, but what research equipment do you have, right? Are you able to take certain types of measurements in the field or do you have access to certain labs where you can submit samples and get analyses done? Um, how much time do you have? How much time does the farmer cooperator have? How much money do you have, right? If you're sending samples off to a lab for analysis, those fees can add up really quickly. Um, what type of skills do you have, right? Are you good with data analysis? Do you know how to use GIS? Can you get uh, yield maps from farmers and clean those yield maps or get, can you create variable rate prescriptions and load those into a, uh, a nutrient applicator? Um, and then, you know, based on whatever limitations you might have to your own resources, think about who you can partner with, right? Most on-farm research is more successful when it's done through partnerships. And so you can partner with, um, academia, you can partner with industry, partner with other farmers, nonprofit organizations, government agencies, all of these are potential partners that can increase your pool of resources and, and leverage the work that you do. So once you've thought about all of these questions kind of at the planning stages, then you can move forward and design a research study that answers these questions uh, for your particular audience within the limits of your resources and, and the partnerships that you have available to you. So some things I want to uh, want you to think about as potential inspirations. Farmers and industry have a wealth of data already 
um, that they just get through the routine operations on their farms, right? We're talking about things like um, yield monitors and yield maps that might be collected over many years. Um, nutrient application maps, right, from variable rate equipment, uh, or even just records that farmers have. A lot of farmers now keep records with different um, management systems that they can go back in time and say, okay, on this field, I know I put this much poultry litter on and this much fertilizer, and I planted this variety with this population, right, and they can help you go back in time and track all of that. Uh, planters now, right, here's a, a smart firmer that ca captures temperature and organic matter, um, you have downforce pressure, seed singulation. Um, that information can be leveraged, you know, for doing research. Uh, we have sensors like uh, electrical conductivity sensors. The Vera sensor here, or the dual EM sensor, can map soils. Um, satellite and drone imagery uh, that is, you know, becoming more and more widely available. Soil and plant tissue testing through the the lab services. Um, these are all sources of data that are available. And so, you know, I would say since this is data that's already being collected, right, without any much additional effort required, right, could you think of creative ways to use this data, leverage this data uh, to set up some on-farm research, right? Maybe you're using this data, but maybe you're just using the technology. Maybe you're using variable rate nutrient application. Uh, maybe you're using electrical conductivity maps to choose different places in the field to lay out plots. Um, so thinking about how to set up a research trial, um, there are a variety of different ways to set up a trial, but you should always think of a few key features. Um, you want to have replication, right? So that means whatever treatment you're looking at as a, a potential alternative or as a comparison, you can't just do that once over here and do the other thing over here because you might have variation in your field that causes one side of the field to yield higher than the other or to have a higher soil test level or something like that. So only by replicating your treatments multiple times can you really sort out on average is one treatment better than the other. Um, you also want to think about randomizing, right? Because there's often spatial patterns in a field, right? The further you get away from a uh, a tree row or something, you tend to get higher yields, or you may be further down into the field, you get into the sweet spot of the soil, right? And so um, you need to kind of randomly apply your treatment so that you're not biasing one treatment by always being kind of to the better side of things. Um, and then, of course, this might seem obvious, but if you're doing research, you really need to have two treatments that you're kind of comparing, right? If you just say, oh, I'm, I'm going to go out and try this new seed variety and see how it works, and you get great weather and you get 300 bushel corn, you think, oh, I got 300 bushel corn because it's a new seed variety, right? No, you got 300 bushel corn because it was a great growing season, right? So you need to have your old seed variety and the new seed variety next to each other in that great growing season to see if they they really make, make a difference. Uh, there's various ways to lay out plots. Um, the classic design is called the randomized complete block design. And this is one of our on-farm research trials here. And uh, it's a nitrogen rate trial, so the, the gallons per acre that you see here is UAN solution, but inside of each orange block is uh, or box, that's a block. And so within that block, uh, we have our six different nitrogen rates randomly assigned. And the idea with blocking is that this part of the field should be as uniform as possible so that these treatments are all deployed in a fairly uniform area. You might have some variation in the field, but ideally within this other block and these other blocks, it's as uniform as possible. And that helps uh, with some of the statistics to, to have a, a blocking effect. But there's a variety of other ways you could set up a design. You could have um, paired strips in multiple fields where you do one thing on this side of the field and the other thing on this side of the field, and that would be considered one replication. But then you do that on five or six different fields, <clears throat> and then... I, ideally, you'd also sort of randomly assign which side of the field each treatment got. But then at the end, if you have yield monitor data, you could then say, okay, well, we've done this side-by-side -side comparison in six different fields, and this is, you know, after six times doing it, this one on average was better. Uh, you can also do paired strips in one field, but you can do it for multiple years, and I'm going to give you an example of that. The challenge though is you might, if you only have one replication of that, you might happen to put one treatment on a better side of the field versus a, a worse side of the field and then it makes that treatment look better. So if you're gonna do a situation like that, 
it's really helpful to have, say, yield data from back in time where you could say, OK, for the last five years, we've had this relationship between the two sides of the field where this side has yielded 10 percent greater than the other side of the field. And then if you start to see, OK, when we implement the change on this side of the field and you do that for a couple of years and all of a sudden that side of the field is yielding 20 percent better than the other side, we've gone from 10 percent better to 20 percent better. It's most likely that's a result of the change that you implemented there. But you need to have some sort of baseline period that you can reference against um, if you're going to set it up that way. Um, there's also opportunities to exploit within field variation and test if there's an interaction. Like, for example, does a practice work better in one soil type versus another soil type? Um, and so you might have yield maps where you know, okay, this is a high yielding part of the field. Or maybe you have electrical conductivity maps and you know this is a clay part of the field and this is a loamy part of the field. Um, and you can test and see does changing a practice within different zones of a field have an impact. Some useful equipment um, and skills, uh, measuring devices. There's measuring wheels that you kind of push along the field. There's measuring tapes that can go to 100 feet or 300 feet. Um, there's sticks, right? Whatever kind of stick you have. This was just like a fiberglass stick that I, I found laying around in a closet. And I'm like, happens to be exactly four feet long. And so sometimes we'll go out to field and we'll take small samples of corn and we harvest all the corn and all the ears and weigh the biomass from four feet of row. And we do that in multiple parts of the field. Um, if we're not going to have like a large area to harvest, we can go out and harvest a small area. Um, plot flags with labels. So um, down here, you see a, a little uh, PVC flag. And, you know, I spent years having flags without labels on them. And then you're like counting over, OK, I'm in my six plots over. Or am I five plots over? Well, let me go back to the beginning and count again, right? So if you can put a little label on the flag and they make weatherproof labels, or you can write a Sharpie on it and give it a plot number so you can locate yourself in the field. Um, a lot of the work that my group does is geospatial. So we're looking at precision agriculture technologies and the location in the field is key because we have yield monitor data, we have soil map data, we have satellite imagery, and we wanna know where we are in the field so having a tablet with GPS and a GIS on it is uh, essential. I use uh, a Microsoft Surface Pro and connect it to a Garmin Glow and run QGIS. And that's a open source um, software uh, that you can download. And I think Sue has a little tutorial that I created for my soil fertility class about how to use QGIS. It goes through a little example. And in about an hour and a half, you can learn to use most of the functionality of, of this open source software. Um, if you want a little higher precision, you, I also have um, an RTK GPS on a staff um, that's made with some new open source um, chips uh, made by Arju Simple. You can connect that to a smartphone and run SW maps and get centimeter level precision. Uh, weighing devices, right? So if you're going to measure some impact on yield or crop productivity, you want to be able to weigh things, right? Um, I've found a lot of farmers now are ha have grain carts with load cells built in, and that's really handy because you can harvest a plot with a combine, dump that plot into the grain cart and measure on the load cells what the mass was, and then divide that by the area using your measuring wheel and get a, a per acre yield. Um, there are scales that you can drive over. Some farms uh, have those drive over scales at the farm. Uh, there's hanging scales. I sometimes really like to use that. You can set it up on a tripod and hang um, like a bucket or a trash can and throw a bunch of ears into it, corn ears or something, and get a mass that way. That way you don't have to worry about, do I have a level surface to work on? Um, you can have bathroom scale, laboratory scale. Um, and then, you know, a useful skill is always statistics, right? So is there a statistical difference in your treatment? And this might be where you need to re reach out to academia, right? Someone like Paul or myself that could help you with the statistics. Um, I tried to find if there was like an online app, like the R software is an open source software for statistics and they have sort of an online interface that people can create um, called Shiny Apps. I tried to see if there was one for basic statistics. I couldn't find one, but maybe I'll, I'll ask Paul to comment on what he might recommend for uh, people doing statistics. So um, there's only a few minutes left in, in my section here. So I want to just give you some really brief examples of some on-farm research that we've conducted. 
that sort of uh, will illustrate some of these best management practices. So we've done a lot of on-farm nitrogen response trials, um, uh, 15 farm fields in the last four years, um, and it's a fairly simple design. Uh, we have six nitrogen rates with four uh, replications, each in a, a block. So the plot map I showed you earlier was from one of our on-farm trials. What we're looking to identify is where is that optimal rate of nitrogen to, to maximize yield, but also the economically optimum nitrogen rate. Our audience is each individual farmer to try and help them understand what's the correct rate to use in their fields. But we're also pooling all of this data across all of the farms and some research station studies to develop better recommendations for all corn growers in Pennsylvania. Um, and so we've been able to develop a new nitrogen recommendation tool that credits cover crops and soil organic matter, and we've revised our PSNT formula and our corn stock nitrate recommendation, the optimum zone, um, through doing a variety of on-farm research uh, with, with cooperating farmers. We, we get to see a broader sample of the uh, sort of farming population by doing the on-farm research as opposed to just sticking around at the research station. Uh, this is an example of a, a purely farmer-led um, project uh, looking at um, deep placement of phosphorus fertilizer. And the farmer was concerned through some initial soil testing, they saw that the nutrients were very stratified in that zero to two inch layer. And they wanted to, they didn't think that that was very available to the crop because it dries out in the middle of the growing season. So they wanted to see, and that stratification happened from a no-till applications of fertilizers on the soil surface. So they wanted to see, does deep placement of phosphorus have an impact? And so here's a picture of their sort of strip till equipment for deep placement. Um, it's pulling a uh, liquid fertilizer solution with phosphorus in it. You can see it going through the soil here. And so the farmer working with one of our extension agents in Lebanon County set this design up. Um, so this is sort of their plot map here. Uh, notice they have replication and randomization. They have the standard treatment, 50 gallons and 25 gallons of the deep placement. Um, and they have, I thought this was great. They ran the ripper through without any fertilizer, right? Because just that soil disruption um, could change something, right? So they wanted to have the soil disruption, but without any nutrient placement. Um, so I thought this was a really great design. The one thing that um, I thought was a little weakness is that after the fact, they told me, well, this field also had 150 pounds per acre of P205 as MAP broadcast on it across the whole field and three tons of poultry litter put on the whole field. And I think those really heavy phosphorus applications to the whole field, even though they were broadcast on the surface and the farmer's concerned they might not be available, I think that's such a heavy application of other phosphorus fertilizers that that might mask any effect. So another sort of best practice would be to sort of minimize the other things that are happening. Like I've had I had consultants come to me and say, oh, we did a potassium trial. We had all these different potassium rates. And the farmer also put out a broadcast application of 150 pounds of K2O before. And then it's like, okay, well, now you just completely saturated the system with potassium and you're not really going to see a, a response to those other doses that you put out. So that's just something to watch out for. Um, we've done on-farm cover crop research where, you know, each farmer kind of chooses their own cover crop type that they want to test a monoculture versus a mixture, but then one neat aspect of this design is that we, at each farm, we put the same four species mix. So this is kind of a control that we used across locations. And we saw that the, the behavior and the services provided by that mixture were very different across the, the three different farm environments and especially compared to the research station. And so that kind of tells us that, okay, you can't just put the same seed mix together and deploy it everywhere and it's gonna behave similarly. Um, so sometimes when you do coordinated on-farm research, if you can deploy the same practice at several locations, it helps you understand how robust is that practice or how sensitive is that practice to different changes in the environment. Um, this is the one uh, soybean example that I have. It was a, a precision soil fertility mapping um, project funded by the Pennsylvania Soybean Board. And we used um, electrical conductivity maps that were uh, created uh, for the farms. And so this is an electrical conductivity map of this field. And this sensor tends to correspond with soil texture. And we wanted to understand, is there differences in fertility levels and, and nutrient response in these different zones? And so we divide the field into uh, a zone one and a zone two based on the electrical conductivity. 
we saw that uh, most of the soil fertility properties, cation exchange capacity, phosphorus, sulfur, pH, clay, varied between the two zones. And then we deployed um, 24 different kind of microplots in the field. Each of these dots is a microplot where we did a fertilizer response trial. And so one, uh, we divided each each spot into um, four uh, four plots. And so they were replicated 24 times throughout the field, but we had with P, K, and S, and then we withheld one nutrient from each of those. So that kind of gives a, a sense for if the crop lost yield when we remove sulfur, then that would indicate there would be a sulfur deficiency in that part of the field. So with this project, we're really trying to validate, is there a benefit to this electrical conductivity mapping? Is there a benefit to making variable rate uh, fertilizer prescriptions in different parts of the field? Uh, the last example I have here, this is um, another on-farm trial uh, where we're looking at variable rate nitrogen applications, and we're also looking at the water quality impacts of this. So in this field, using GIS um, and openly available elevation data, we were able to trace two different um, small drainage catchments within the field. And we installed some soil uh, water sampling devices in each catchment. And then on one side of the catchment, we implemented a variable rate nitrogen application that's called this BMP catchment here. And uh, that variable rate nitrogen application, we used our new tool that credits cover crops and soil organic matter. We found that on average, um, we side rest 52 pounds of nitrogen versus the typical farmer rate would be to side rest 75 pounds per acre at, at a flat rate. And one of the reasons that this side rest rate was less is because a lot of zones in the field because of low yield potential, didn't actually call for any side rest. So these little gaps in the prescription here are where no nitrogen went out at all. Um, and so we'll then use combine yield data to, um, well, we, we created a variable rate prescription and we gave it to the farmer. They loaded it in their sprayer and they just went across the field and they didn't re really know in the tractor what zone they were in because it was just following the prescription that we had prepared for them ahead of time. Um, and then we'll go back and we'll collect small uh, hand samples of yield from strategic points in each of these zones, but then we'll also have combine yield monitor data available at the end of the season. So to conclude, um, I think there's many ways to do on-farm research. There's not one right way. There's lots of right ways, um, but you need to think carefully, plan ahead, uh, ask yourselves those questions that I described at the beginning, build a team that has the necessary resources and, and go for it. So um, that's all I have to share for, for my part. Um, I will let uh, Paul go ahead here and um, share his slides. So. Thank you, Charlie. Um, as Paul gets his slides up and running, I did want to make just another announcement. If anyone has joined us late, uh, there was a question in the chat about whether or not this is being recorded. It is a recorded webinar. So just keep that in mind. Um, and it will be uploaded to the Mid-Atlantic for our YouTube page later this week if you want to review anything. And then just a final call that if you haven't already and you would like to receive credit for uh, attending this webinar, whether that's Act 38 or CCA, please put your name and your certification number in the chat so we can make sure you get credit for that. And Paul, I will turn it over to you. All right, so thank, thank you, Brooke. And everyone can see my slides okay, I assume. So I will take a little bit. And I, I really need to thank Charlie for my part because he set this up very well. And I think allowed me to spend a little more time on how we've approached it, maybe across Pennsylvania with this, what I call the continually evolving uh, soybean on farm network. So I wanna thank uh, Sue and Brooke and Eric and the PA4R our alliance for this invitation, because I think this is a great opportunity for our network, which is very large, to kind of have this conversation with you a little bit of how we approach it. Um, quickly, Charlie mentioned the R, the use of open source statistical tools. So Charlie, you're right. Actually, there isn't a nice, easy tool for some of the basic stuff we would need. This is a conversation I've had with a colleague for several years now, and I finally have somebody in place, I think, for us to try to build something. So let's take a wait and see approach. I'll probably have to touch base with you a little bit about the designs and all of this that we might want to contemplate, but but it is definitely a need for ease of access for people that way. So 
I'm starting here with a little video. I have this just to show kind of over time how we've adapted our model. This is cover crop incorporation into standing soybean with the actual benefit being in the subsequent season. You know, this sort of trial is great on paper until you try to run it. And we've learned a lot about some of the logistics that come with that. And it's really important, you know, to, to learn and adapt in these on-farm networks with the design. One of the things we're learning as we move forward with a project like that is really what is the broadcast with, um, even if it's thought to be known. For all of you in the audience, I have here these two links. And actually, if you just go to the Pennsylvania soybean.org uh, site, the, the soybean board, you can find all of this. Everything I talk about in some degree, you can find actual reports going back to 2009. They're in two forms, uh, sort of an annual report, as you see on my left, and, and what you see on my right, which is the more recent annual reports that are summarizing all projects funded by the Soybean Board. So a lot of what I talk about here, you can go into detail on any of these and learn a little bit more about them. One of the things I want to emphasize, and Charlie, Charlie brought this out very well, is he hit on a lot of high points on how to conduct it, how to build partnerships. And I think that's been one of the value. And I don't get to take credit for this. You know, we're a collaboration among farmers, crop consultants, industry, all of us on our extension team, along with other faculty, postdocs, graduate students, undergraduate interns, and, and also our staff, staff people. That's the only way we can make this, this go in the way we envision it. And one of the things we've had to learn, though, especially with the extension side is we're, we're continually evolving. Our team changes. So a big aspect of how we approach these sort of questions is also the educational training of our educators. They come from very different backgrounds and, and some have a stronger research, some have a stronger educational background. And we try to work with them to bring them up to speed and identify for them in their local areas, which projects may be most appropriate in that respect. So as you've seen me kind of just over the last couple of years flip through this, you can sense that our team has changed um, and including bringing on more of our faculty members uh, as you'll see how we've done that over the last couple of years to, to maybe simplify, make more efficient our on-farm network and, and, and make it clear to, to the stakeholders what we're trying to do working with them. What we've seen as a value to our on-farm network is, is and Charlie, so some of this is a repeat a little bit of what Charlie was mentioning. It's really a research-based approach to look at different inputs. As we've evolved, we've both taken a stronger emphasis on monitoring um, and, and, and scouting and other aspects of that because of the type of questions we're learning. It's helped us develop larger trials, um, we use a mixed methodology of how we design the experiment a little bit, but it's improving then the effectiveness, reducing variation by exploring the field with the farmer, understanding that for many of the questions we approach, it enables us to compare with other states who've done similar sort of work. And we also recognize this is why we brought some pieces in recently about pest patch pressure and profile differences across Pennsylvania to help us work with individuals and design these a little differently. Charlie nailed this one. Study details are critical through all facets. And more importantly, this, this is only valuable when we have this kind of back and forth on the assessment and educational pieces. We learn as much from our stakeholders and farmers through some of the methods we are applying to, to adapt and evolve over time as much as I think we're helping them learn uh, by conducting such trials. So each of our each of our programs, we have a really different trial structure and, and method of data collection. And the, the protocols are very critical to be developed in this respect. And, and what we see here are those examples um, of that, you know, the different tools. This is measuring uh, biomass in a, it, for cover crops, while the same sort of approach can be used for slug monitoring. We know we have to do a lot of training on growth uh, development and physiology in that respect. Um, as well as, as one, one of the caveats or one of the pieces we do with the design working with each farmer is learn how comfortable they are with different designs. So this would be kind of the randomized complete block in a simplified version that Charlie showed, maybe with two treatments, you know, with randomization, obviously within the blocks being the ideal, but each educator develops that relationship with the farmer to help them define it. 
And we also use our research farm. While it doesn't give us the best answers, we use it in a way that allow us to at least kind of do some validation of what we're seeing uh, at a local level, maybe on a little smaller plot basis. What I'm gonna do here for the next several slides is you're gonna see a kind of a map of Pennsylvania and you see our network here and there's multiple, some, some of these have multiple locations within the same county. I've kind of given the overall general design types, either replicated strip trials, what we do field monitoring based on yield maps. So something similar to understand that, that site specific variation to do some of the, look at some of the below ground aspects of our, our style of work for diseases or other things. And then what I term just a replicated completely random design, that's probably more appropriate to call it for sampling, you know, how we lay out a field to do say slug monitoring or, or our, our large scale scouting efforts more at a landscape level. So for each trial, you're going to see a number kind of aside that, that ma matches up sort of the design type. One of the key things we do with this sort of network is we try to replicate the experiment over three years where appropriate. Now there's a lead for each study, so it's not me driving everything. And they can make the decision if they either have enough information within two years or one year even in some of these situations, or if they see they need to make a change. Good example is probably some of the technology we're gonna explore for maybe um, more precision approaches to weed management. John, John Wallace leads that area and he's got an opportunity that would fit into the network that we think might be better. So there we might will modify and probably stop the research that he was currently doing at two years. But ideally we look at it in three year increments to get some of that variation from year to year. And you can see over time, new projects come in and others go out. Um, one of the things working with the soybean board I should mention here is they've really emphasized with us trying to get into these areas that are outside of that Lancaster, Lebanon, sort of South Central to Southeast corridor. We've made an ex extensive effort to get to the North and the West um, to some degree of success, but our team also who helped coordinate with the local, working with the farmers locally, we've seen a bit of a turnover there. So, so it's been one of the, the bigger challenges. We've maintained that identity, uh, but we also have to look at it from different perspectives. You know, one of the things is adapting to the environment here. So here you can just see sort of a, a trial and deep ripping that evolved after the record rainfalls of 2018. Uh, you know, it, sometimes our trials don't give us the answer. And uh, Charlie in one of his slides had Andrew Lefever kind of mentioned there. And we, Andrew did a lot more extensive work on this sort of question. And I think that taught us a lot coming back to the network, actually, what we should have been thinking about. But there's a lot of things you learn by by trying at least. Trial and error here is actually very valuable. You know, a big piece of one of the strengths of a, a network like this is even with COVID, we were able to maintain that since, since extension was deemed essential uh, early on. This allowed us with some modification to maintain our network. It took a little bit more logistics and how we did that, but I think this this is the nice thing of having a large team involved with what we do in that respect uh, to be able to drive some of these things. And you can see even in a year like 2020, uh, we, hit, we hit the mark pretty well. Um, our trial numbers or monitoring numbers can range from about 50 to 60 or more across the Commonwealth and anywhere from I'd say 20 to 30 counties on an annual basis. But all of these are done working with farmers to see what they, they're they most interested in in that respect. Another thing about this sort of network that we do with our experiments is as we learn, we start to incorporate, and I'm highlighting here what is termed the seed treatment trial and yield limiting. Um, so our yield limiting work really looked at initially the idea of what was a high yielding area of the field to a low area to get a contrast. A lot of this was below ground uh, working in the arena of microbiomes. As we evolved that project based on what we learned, we were able to incorporate the methodology into some of our seed treatment work uh, for fungicides or more recently. Uh, and this, uh, some of this was also done with Olivo because of questions about nematodes or other below ground diseases. We've been able to adapt our protocols at, in a way that keeps that link between the farmer and us as well. 
Here, this map looks a little different because it was done in collaboration with the Soybean Board for Ag Progress Day. So there's some additional pieces, but again, showing you a lot of the same thing. Um, I'm gonna highlight a couple major changes that we, we did with this um, program in the 2022 growing season. Uh, one of the good things with a network like this is the communication internally as well. And so working with John Tooker, John Wallace, and then with Daniela Carrillo coming on board also, we started to discuss what other needs we could do. And this came out of some of the educational pieces or how can we make our, our projects more efficient. So here I say, you know, a key caveat or a key thing that one really needs to think about is that listening to local needs to design this. And so farmers had a lot of questions and we went around uh, during this time for some breakfast meetings in areas we haven't been able to always um, have success in with this network, listen to their needs. You know, one thing that came out very clearly was a basic agronomy 101 type question uh, in that how what we do on the research farm with variety testing doesn't match their local environments, either due to elevation or, or just physical location, the distance between uh, based on what maturity groups. So how do, you, how do you create smaller scale variety testing programs that can be done in locations that would, would benefit from having that local knowledge as we try to just even dial in some of the basics of agronomy with that. So here's an example from Snyder County, one in Cambria. So Plot sizes are maybe not field length, but they're much larger than we would do on the research farm. This also gives us an idea of how, in this Cambria County one, this was also hit by white mold quite extensively, and it taught us quite a bit about where that maturity disease interaction comes into play in particular. So there were other pieces that came in. The other big piece here was integrating our landscape, what I call landscape level monitoring. So John Tooker over about the same period of time had been leading a Sentinel monitoring program. Um, we discussed this to bring it into the network as much because our, our educators are in the same sort of field and the same with a, a large scale nematode sampling program. So how do we add value to each of our, our, our trial projects? And so, this has been very good because I think it allows us to maximize what, we, what we're doing for an, an extensive network. And we provide, I think, an additional value back to each trial because we're collecting more information than we maybe have done in the past on individual trials that way. You know, you know as we look to this year, you can see some of this come into play a bit more. These are the number of sites we have. This just shows you we're working about uh, 25, 58, almost 70 and 70 uh, field locations across what we do accordingly. But, um, and it's very valuable at that level to be able to, 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 to maximize these efforts and, and address the farmer needs. In, in the last part, I'm gonna kind of give you a, a little overview of how we've adapted and worked with them. Um, you know, initially when I moved here, we were trying to do a series of summer field days. Here's a successful example. I could give you other examples and also winter workshop. What we've come to realize in this kind of, this in part grew out of also listening to the local needs and listening to or talking among us as colleagues about where we see success and things like the organic study circles, a little more informal, a little more personal approach where we we can get out with, with a smaller group of farmers or consultants to explore the issues in that respect. We've used the breakfast or lunch meetings to help us to find new project areas. The big thing has always been having it be farmer led um, or farmer driven. I always, I can, I can assure you every time I'm there, I'm always fascinated when, when the farmers start to talk, how the ears perk up in the audience because you can see you can see that sort of back and forth, more dynamic conversation. I was just in Union County a couple of weeks ago with Daniela and Anna Hogson um, with about five. And I mean, we, we went on for three hours and probably could have went on for another three hours with a lot of what we were doing because there was a more dynamic uh, style to what that that conversation was and and it helped us because we've identified new cooperatives for 2024 and uh, understanding sort of where they're coming from with the research questions they would like to ask. 
We also have a large ex and extensive training, uh, whether it's at our graduate or undergraduate level, you know, working closely through intern training. Uh, they get trained at crop scouting, among other things in this. This has value to drive some of the research questions we, we look at. This is just one example of, of several based on using more of a landscape or on-farm approach to doing that. And I think this is helpful because it forces us to have that conversation back and forth. These aren't always the easiest things to interpret or, or define for, for our stakeholders that way. What's been the impact of this? Um, so here, Del Boy put this together and I, I, I kind of use it because we've got almost now 15 or so years approximately in this network. You know, we've explored different questions in isolation that help us understand where we think there may or may not be some probability of response using this sort of model. Interestingly enough, it also integrates into some of the things we're doing right now at a larger at a larger scale at a more regional level where where we've been able to adapt this idea and 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 tackle a different sort of question based on what farmer practices look like. But this is allowing us, you know, to come into the meetings, say, ask the question, get the feedback and, and back and forth, and also help us redesign some of those trials. You know, there's the, the changes in practices, they've been good with our workshop, but I think more importantly is the value and honesty. And I'm going to jump right to the bottom. This is from our last go around. We had, we had a direct quote. We want to see if you're competent. And, and I think an honest assessment like that is very, very telling because, you know, if we're, if we want to convince or we want to collaborate with our stakeholders, we have to have an open and honest conversation about their needs and also how to design that in a manner that is, is amenable to, to all parties to address these sort of questions. So, it, you know, and the other thing for us as Penn State in this situation, you know, was a direct comment about the 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 idea that we're probably behind industry to some degree we don't have the same budgets obviously but the best part of that comment and just to just to make me feel better i guess was that you know how we were presenting that conversation or working with them through that conversation they had a good feeling about the future and i mean i think charlie's talk illustrates that as well you know we're really trying to get at these sort of questions now where are we headed as i close i mean Part of our network gives us the luxury, I think, to work and we're working with some startup companies on the drone side, as well as some farmers who have drones to explore that. So remember the first video I showed you, we are now working with a startup to try to work on uh, uh, cover crop incorporation with, with drones where they have a real uh, goal of increasing capacity in the drone. And so it's a it's a win-win for everybody and I think for our cooperators as well. So this is something we're very excited by. We're also integrating in much like Charlie showed some of the drone technology here. This is one of our long-standing cooperators. We're using several of his fields by mapping the field a little differently. You can see here probably the line. It's allowing us to redesign some of these trials at different scales to address those questions. And then lastly, we integrate this and scale it up and we have a large regional network where we can use our network uh, for a different sort of goal. So our soybean fentanyl monitoring where we're starting to map um, a series of abiotic stressors, disease, pests, and weeds. Um, and this is a providing what we think is a valuable service for all parties to get at this sort of spatially explicit questions that we need to do. And, and the same as we integrate in some of the weather uh, factors, which will help us design maybe our sampling protocols a little differently and also how we lay out the trial that way. And then long-term, we continually evolve. This is a different project that we will integrate in probably into our network by, by integrating other research we do that's across, across Pennsylvania not necessarily under a non-farm mindset, but using uh, fields as, a, as, our, as our vessel for data collection, it allows us to redesign and continue to evolve. And that's a big thing with a, with a network such as this. So my closing thoughts here are, you know, this network doesn't exist without a really large cooperative effort. And, and the ideas have continued to evolve, but you know, our budgets have gone up, yes, but I think our, our efforts have gone up substantially. 
kind of highlighting some of the things Charlie was mentioning, we've had to take multiple approaches to develop the trials and protocols. And then uh, the adaptation over time is also very critical. And so we've modified how we do local needs assessments to work with, with our cooperators. And I think going forward, it's this precision technology and scalability that'll drive a lot of our network. Uh, uh, and I think will help us do, do the research and collaborate together accordingly. And then we've also been able to leverage and position in this situation, Pennsylvania soybean and our on-farm network at regional and national levels. So I'm gonna close there and I'll be glad to take any questions in the remaining time that way. So uh, thank you, Brooke. Yeah, thank you, Paul. And I, I appreciate the uh, QR code there for any of our CCAs who are on the call that you could just scan in. It makes life a little easier for getting those credits. So at this point, I'm going to open up to Q&A. Uh, we do have a few in the chat, but if you would like to um, raise your hand and come off and ask your question verbally, that's fine too, or else you can enter it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen there. So I'm going to start with... Uh, microclimate. So Carl is asking any thoughts on managing field microclimates for crop fertility? And I'm curious to know how you how you might integrate that into a, a field trial. Yeah, so I don't um, when I think microclimate, I think sort of like the atmosphere and the moisture level in the air around that. Um, which maybe is very like topographically induced. And I think a lot of those microclimates probably have different soil environments as well. Um, and I think you'd probably see some of that show up through yield monitor data or maybe electrical conductivity maps. Um, and that would, I think, give you a helpful way to understand, do I need more nutrients here, right? If you have a higher yield, sometimes you might need more nutrients to support that yield. But maybe you've also got higher fertility levels there, so you then maybe you need less nutrients to support that same yield. So I think you need to do a, a variety of sampling there, like soil samples, and do some yield samples there and see, you know, get a sense for it. But certainly I think it could vary between a field from, you know, the top of a knob to down in a low spot. So, Paul, do you have any thoughts on that? I know you deal with a lot of, like, disease-induced issues and in yeah. field microclimates. Yeah, the field microclimate for us, especially when we're trying to design an experiment, become really important because depending on how we design it will influence the results. Since we know there's a lot of soil-borne diseases that are very spatially aggregated, so they're usually in low wet spots or areas of higher compaction, and it's very easy to to miss it. Even when we try to map everything, it's very easy to miss it because the big factor will be the weather what happens each growing season but looking at that you know in a in a very different manner and actually some of the work we're doing we look at thermal imagery to see if we can pick up these patch patterns across a field early which would allow us to adjust maybe the design uh i think that you know the, the technology is there to to do that and i think that's a direction but it takes it takes a pretty heavy lift and a really good um you know, for the team, it takes a really good computational person who can drive a lot of that. And and we've just now on our, in our network, been able to secure somebody who can do that. And I think, but those are really, for us, they're really valuable. All right. Thank you. Um, Carl also asks about pollinator strips. Any thoughts about pollinator strips spaced throughout the field for biodiversity and pollinator habitat? Does that impact a field trial? Is that something that you are, are looking at or you're specifically looking more at seed treatments, at fertilization, those kinds of things? Yeah, but no, that's a good one. I, it's interesting because I am collaborating with in other projects. I, interestingly, more on the tech side with somebody like Christina Grosinger from our Pollinator Center. Um, we haven't explored that, but, but I think that... You know, that's the sort of question that would be worth having the conversation. How do you, how, how might you do it? How might the cooperator look at it? What else can we add value around it? Um, 
we've taken an approach kind of looking at production practices in a broad sense, but nothing nothing specific to this. There was um, a professor who retired from Penn State a few years ago, Shelby Fleischer, who is our vegetable extension entomologist. And um, I know he was working on a project with pumpkin growers where they um, periodically would plant strips through the pumpkin field of a cover crop mixture. And their goal was to support the squash bees um, with floral resources throughout the growing season to keep them sustained such that when the pumpkins started blooming, they were there and ready to go. But the challenge was they couldn't, they didn't want to have flowering cover crops that were more preferable when the pumpkins were flowering. So they had to ha have the, that strip um, either not flowering or come through and mow it or something like that to reduce the flowers. So to push them all into the pumpkin. So it was very kind of a very elaborate, um, approach and he was doing that on farm. Uh, I don't know many more details other than that, but I think it's an interesting idea that's worth investigation. Nice. We have, Carl has a lot of questions. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any questions that they'd like to, to pose to our group. We probably have time for one more. Um, if not, I'll, I'll be happy to keep going. Carl, um, would like to know if you think that climate change is impacting invasive species at all and how is that impacting field trials? Mm, I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's more weeds that are coming in because of climate change. Uh, it's beyond my expertise level. Okay. Yeah, I'm just trying to think because part of part of what John Wallace was defining or developing with with the network was, but it was very targeted to specific weeds, and I'm not sure that's a climate change impact, more of a probably a long term management impact uh, in that respect. But you know, I think I think for us as we continue to develop maybe long term monitoring programs that link with this sort of network those sort of questions can start to be asked because we are collecting that sort of spatially explicit data that lets us see what how those fields change over time okay and i just had one more question for the two of you if someone is interested um, they have a client that's interested they have they are a farmer who is interested in, in getting in on some of these research networks or research plots what what are the steps involved with with that? What's the time commitment? Is it two years? Is it five years? Is it indefinite? How does that all, all work with the Penn State Network? Paul, do you want to uh, discuss for this on-farm soybean network, and then I can share yeah, my yeah. thoughts for my group? Yeah, so for the on-farm network, you know, maybe the easiest is, uh, is talking with the local extension educator at first, um, or reaching out to me directly. Um, or any any of us uh, in that respect, the the time commitment we've tried to do with for the more extensive research studies we've tried to take lessen the load for the farmer, who we know is very busy, you know to work with them on the design and then we've added value by by offering up our team services to help with the data collection and monitoring that's kind of built into the budget. Do you need to make a long-term time commitment? I think there have been some cooperatives here since the infancy and others who pop in and pop out. Um, and so it, it just varies and it varies unfortunately as well as our team continues to kind of ebb and flow a little bit. Uh, but we try to we try to maintain that connectivity with all the farmers and address their needs as appropriate. Yeah, and in my group, I mean, the examples I showed kind of give you a sense of the variety of different types of projects, and we have things that are very, um, very in depth. I mean, there's one the the paired watershed that I showed you, right? That's a five probably going to be a five year study by the time we're done. Um, but we try and make it as minimally invasive on the farmer as possible. They're just keeping their corn soy rotation. We've got some water sampling devices there. We provided them the nitrogen prescription, so they really didn't have to do anything different other than just load that prescription. Um, and so we're just sort of piggybacking off of their normal operations. Um, farms that are, are 
designs that are more intensive on the farmer, we tend to only ask for a one-year commitment unless they show a lot of enthusiasm and kind of invite us back for more or they want to do more, then we're usually open if they're a good collaborator. And, and usually they are folks that do that. Um, but we also offer engagement where I, I showed you like that deep tillage study. I've never set foot on that farm to look at the study. I wish I had time to, but they sort of, it's all just sort of been email and phone call exchange and they collect the samples and send them to the lab and I get the reports and run statistics and discuss what's happening. So, you know, that's also another option that, um, you know, is sort of more led by the farmer and, and his extension educator than my program coming in and saying, all right, this is what we're going to do. So there's really a variety. And I'd say just reach out to me and say, hey, I've got this idea. Um, sometimes it's after the fact and people are sharing the data and saying, can you help me make sense of the data? And we'll always try and make time to sit down and, and make sense of it and, and help you with what you need. Awesome. All right. So thank you, Charlie and, and Paul, for your time, for your expertise. As they've kind of run through things from that academic field trial perspective, next week, we're excited to welcome Eric Rosenbaum in to talk with us about the crop consultants perspective on field trials and how maybe we set things up a little bit differently for farmers who are looking to just get a better understanding of what's going on in their fields, but can't commit to some of the more intensive um, practices mm -hmm. and, and rotations and things and treatments that, that Charlie and Paul were discussing with us today. So if you haven't registered for that and you would like to, there's a link in the resources tab that you can click and you can sign up there. At this point, I'm going to ask that anyone who is on the call looking to get credits, re-enter your name and your certification numbers, please. And then at the end of the webinar, again, there is a brief five question, three minute survey that we would love to get your feedback on so that we can continue to improve our interactions and our uh, education with you all. So thank you both again for your time, for your uh, materials and for being an available resource for farmers in Pennsylvania. Pleasure to be here today. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Thank Have you. Have a everyone. great day, everyone.